now we have our rock stars. Um, <laughs> first, I have the uh, great pleasure in introducing Professor John Quackenbush. Um, John received his PhD in 1990 in theoretical physics from UCLA, working on string theory models. Um, following two years as a postdoctoral fellow in physics, he was then awarded a career award from the National Centre for the Human Genome Research to work on the Human Genome Project. Um, he spent two years at the Salk Institute, two years at Stanford, um, working on at the interface of genomics and computational biology. Um, in 1997, he joined the faculty of the Institute for Genomic Research, and then in 2005, he joined the faculties of the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard School of Public Health. So we'd like to welcome John. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't know how that crept in there, but anyway, um, <laughs> welcome, John. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing. So. Uh, but Louisa, thank you very much for inviting me. It really is an honor to be here. Uh, it, it's, it's really wonderful to be at an institution um, like this center, which is looking, I think, at the future of health and health care, really driven by data. And I can tell you that this trend is not a trend which um, you're alone here and sort of spearheading. Um, we've been wrestling with this problem at Harvard for a long time. In our department, we've started new master's programs in computational biology and quantitative genetics. We're trying to integrate computation as a core competency in biostatistics, which may sound like something we should have already been doing, but in fact, many of our students are struggling with dealing with the kinds of data which have recently become available. We're actually starting to try to discuss now creating master's programs in data science and health, realizing that data science and health are two things which need to be put together but often aren't. And that really we need students who are trained at this interface between dealing with massive amounts of data, dealing with quantitative measures for making sense of that data, and who understand the basic health and biological problems which we want to address using these data. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you a little bit, some stories from our experience of looking at data and thinking about how we take data, how we manage it, how we use it to address a range of, of problems and questions in health and biomedical research, really with the idea that one day we'd like to be able to really drive precision medicine. So uh, I gave a talk early today, and one of the things that I like to do in talks is use quotes. Um, this was a quote actually from me, uh, <laughs> because I couldn't find one that said what I wanted, but um, I, if you share it with your friends, it will become famous, and then I'll be justified in quoting myself. Uh, but this is really true if you think about this. Every revolution in science, almost anything you can think of from the Copernican heliocentric model to statistical and quantum mechanics, Darwin's theory of evolution to the theory of the gene, they've all been driven by access to data. That if we have data, what we can do is look at our existing models, we can test them, we can either verify them and move on with confidence, or we can falsify them. If we falsify them, it gives us opportunities to develop new models and new approaches. And so data drives innovation. But we have to use that data appropriately and responsibly to make new discoveries. And that's really the challenge. We have to have access to data. And I applause, Lu, applaud Louisa for bringing together so much data here and putting it in a usable form, because that, that's the other problem. Having data doesn't mean you have access to data. Having existing stores of data doesn't mean that data can be used. And those are some of the biggest challenges. They're not challenges for which you get um, publications in top tier journals. But they, that effort is really the effort that enables people to analyze the data and get those publications in top tier journals. That's the journeyman's work that really enables science to progress. And that's an essential part of the success of data science in health and, and biomedical research. But what are the driving trends? Why is this field so exciting at the present? And I think there are a couple things we can look at. The first is advances in biomedicine. Where are those advances coming from? The way I tend to think about this is that data drives our ability to think about the natural life cycle of disease. That we tend to think about, in my field at least, having access to genomic data. But in fact, genomic data is part of the puzzle. We have to take into account environment and lifestyle. We have to look at different populations, see what factors affect those populations, and how those factors mitigate and mediate disease and disease response. 
and that there's some of those things that we can control and some of them that we can't. We know that smoking is one of the worst risk, risk factors for almost every cancer and a host of other diseases. And that's one of the most correctable problems we can think about in a public health sector that we often don't think about in the context of research that we do. But that factor alone can influence a lot of how we interpret genomic or other sources of data when we think about the development and progression of disease. We can think about environmental exposures, toxins, pesticides, almost anything else that really influence this entire spectrum of response uh, and life cycle of disease. But the type of data that we've had access to has really been genomic data. And what we've tended to think about in the work that I and my colleagues do is really looking at this entire life cycle. Can we look at available data and estimate genetic risk? Every single one of us in this room carries a genetic risk for some disease. But if we sequenced our genomes today, since most of us are in our 20s or 30s or maybe a little older, what I could probably tell you is that you have an increased risk for something. But can I really predict what is going to affect you? And the answer is probably not. If you had a highly penetrant Mendelian disorder, you'd probably already know it. If you had cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease or any one of a host of other diseases that was highly penetrant, really linked to a specific mutation, you'd know it already. So what you carry is a whole host of risk factors, and those risk factors are, again, mediated and mitigated by environmental influences. So we can look at your genetic risk, and we can tell you some things, but that's only part of the puzzle. Where genomic data and information really starts to become important is when you start to develop diseases. So what we'd like to be able to do is to use our technologies to do a better job of early detection. Can we look for signs like particular mutations in circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA or in prenatal health looking at circulating fetal DNA in the mother's bloodstream to be able to detect the presence of certain disorders for which we can intervene or make other decisions based on that information by having access to the relevant data. Once we detect the presence of a disease, what we're increasingly starting to think about doing is not only looking at the disease site but really looking at the genetic background of the disease, to think about stratifying patients, staging disease, and most importantly, selecting treatment options that are most appropriate for that patient. If I were to sequence your genome, as I said earlier, there's not much I can say that will probably have a big influence on you making a decision how to lead your life, right? The single risk factor for diabetes, which has a genetic association to it, uh, has one-tenth the predictive power of body mass index. So I can run an expensive genetic screen, or I can put you on a scale. And the scale, for free, is going to give me a lot more information that's going to tell me about your risk, factor, risk factors for diabetes. On the other hand, if you had colorectal cancer, and I were to sequence your tumor genome and discover you had a KRAS mutation, I could tell your treating physician that EGFR inhibitors are a class of drugs that are unlikely to work for you. So it's data in context that's really important. And as we start to look at that data in context, we can really start to direct our patients, we hope, to the most appropriate treatment options with the goal of improving outcomes and quality of life. Even in the last 10 years, what's been really exciting is we've been able to make tremendous progress from technologies like array-based technologies, which give us a snapshot of gene expression information uh, in different tissues for thousands or tens of thousands of genes. We can look at genetic variation at millions of locations across the genome. But new technologies like DNA sequencing technologies are giving us access to deeper, richer, more complex sources of data and information. From the same patient, I can get information about their genetic background. I can get information about patterns of gene expression. I can get information about epigenetic factors like DNA methylation, which may moderate some of the expression effects or genetic effects. And so from the same individual now, new technologies are allowing us to generate very complex sources of data, which are much more informative for building the kinds of predictive models we ultimately want to be able to build. And what's really driven our ability to generate data has been the falling cost of data generation. This is an economic problem as much as anything else. The first human genome was sequenced in 2000, and the estimate was that in 2001, the cost of sequencing a genome was well over $100 million. The time that it would take to sequence your genome was months, not days. 
And so to generate data, there were top cost and time barriers to really trying to create useful information. The cost of sequencing started to fall, and it was dropping by about a factor of two every 15 to 18 months. But in 2007, new technologies were introduced that caused the cost of sequencing to plummet. And when I look at this and really start to think about this in real terms, a key time for me was in 2009 when the cost of sequencing a genome was $100,000. Even in 2009, what we knew in cancer was enough that I would say honestly in 2009 if my wife or son had a rare tumor that was refractory to therapy, I would mortgage our house and sequence their genome. Today, I can pay, oops, pay for that with lots of other information. I can pay for that with a credit card, okay? It costs less than you probably paid if you came from Perth to fly here and back than it would to sequence your genome. And that simple statement about the cost of sequencing is what's really driving, driven the availability of data. It almost costs less not to generate data today than it does to generate it, right? That storing data can be more expensive than generating data. And so we have this unique opportunity to collect massive quantities of data. The challenge that faces us is to do something meaningful with it. But sequencing isn't alone. There are other sources of information that are really exciting in terms of what we can start to generate and look at in understanding disease and disease phenotype. So this is some slides I borrowed from my colleague uh, Hugo Ertz. Hugo is one of the pioneers in this field called radiomics. And what we can start to do is to look at things like tumor imaging data and recognize that even if we have a single type of tumor, these are non-small cell lung carcinomas, even for a single tumor, the tumors are all very different. Some are very smooth and uniform, others are very spiky, some are large, some are small, and that the differences in these tumors represent quantitative phenotypes that we can now assay based on their properties and use them as predictive biomarkers. And Hugo and I are actually working on a series of very interesting projects to try to take this data that he calls radiomics data and to combine it with genomic data to identify new predictive biomarkers. And I can tell you that in non-small cell lung carcinoma, we identified features in the images that are predictive of KRAS and EGFR mutations. And if you think about that in a precision health uh, environment, we like to be able to think about measuring genetic mutations in these tumors as a way of guiding therapy. But we typically get one shot at a biopsy. When we treat patients, we image them every few months. And our hope is by expanding our um, repertoire of imaging features in genomic mutations and showing that those are predictive and persistent over time, we can actually, we hope, detect the occurrence of mutations in tumors by looking at radiographic images and begin to be able to detect ahead of time when patients are becoming refractory to therapy because they're developing mutations that are going to cause them to be refractive to therapy. So we're at this point with this brave new world with data that what we really need to be able to do is to take that data and integrate it with clinical information in ways in which we can derive new insight into the underlying processes, but also contribute in new ways to managing patients and patient <laughs> care. The other piece of the puzzle is advances in computation. And one of the things everybody talks about day in and day out in this field is the cloud. What is the cloud? Well, cloud is basically big sources of big uh, farms of computers somewhere. You can draw pretty graphics representing the ethereal nature of the cloud. What the cloud really means is that today you no longer have to build your own data farm or compu computing farm that you can take access of large-scale distributed computing. And whether that's a university-based cloud or a public cloud, the real challenge is no longer generating the data. It's no longer storing the data. It's really developing the protocols to allow you to move the data to a secure storage location and to be able to bring computing resources on demand to analyzing those data. One of the biggest challenges we face with patient health data is data security and data access. And one of the things that's been very clear is that there are myths about data security that simply do not need to be barriers to providing access to the data. With the proper encryption and the proper access protocols, it doesn't matter whether the data is stored 
in a, a resource here in this building or across the state or somewhere far away in the country, as long as we have the right security and access protocols, our ability to bring computing power to analyzing data is now almost unlimited. And what that means is that we have opportunities to discover new patterns in data by leveraging these growing computational resources with the growing sources of data that we have. The other thing, though, that's been really informative for me in thinking about data and data access is the smartphone. And if you think about the original iPhone, the iPhone took the world by storm, not because it was a great phone, okay? And not because it was trendy, although that was probably a big part of it. What I really think about in terms of the iPhone, which has really been an important lesson to me, is the fact that it's infinitely customizable. Everybody has a phone, and your phone is different than my phone. And the reason iPhones have become so important in other smartphones is that you can customize it to provide you with the tools you need to do specific things. Right? And that's the same lesson we've learned in looking at big data, that it's, we all want to draw on the same data, whether we're health administrators or researchers or physicians. It's patients with their genomic and clinical and imaging data wrapped together. But the questions that a clinician wants to ask are different than the questions a researcher wants to ask, are different than the questions a hospital administrator wants to ask. So we not only need to think about gathering the data and making it accessible, we also need to think about gathering the data and making it usable to different constituents who want to draw on the data. In the same way that uh, the iPhone and its apps allow us to use the same underlying technology, but in different ways that meet our own specific needs. So if we think about this, we have advances in, in biomedicine, we have advances in computing, we also have advances at the interface between them. And this has really been driven by access to these complex sources of data. My career has really built, been built around genomic data, but I can tell you in the last few years, as we've had access to more and more data, that data has got to be linked to clinical data and information, information about the patients themselves. I've told you about some of the work we've done to try to link this to imaging data and other types of laboratory tests. And as we link data together, we're starting to see patterns emerge that we couldn't have seen by looking at any one individual data type in isolation. But we have access to other sources of data and information we can draw upon. We can look at drug research in pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, and in academic laboratories. We can try to link that to health records from claims data from insurance companies or from the National Health Service. We can start to link this to social media data. And my friend and colleague J.P. O'Neill has been doing really pioneering work in trying to take social media data like Twitter feeds and understand where there are uh, health outbreaks from things like flu, but also where patients or individuals are reporting things which point to environmental exposures, increased pollution, toxins in the environment, by simply looking at what they're reporting, what patients or what individuals are saying to each other in the context of these social networks. And if we can start to link this with health information, we can actually start to see where outbreaks are occurring. And increasingly, we're starting to think about ways of monitoring individuals to generate direct information from those individuals that we can use in the context to do a better job of monitoring patients, to look for adverse events, to look for compliance with treatment protocols, to look for things like uses of emergency rooms by integrating data from those patients together with other sources of information. So it's a brave new world in health and biomedical research, provided we can link all of this information together. This is a graphic I really like. This is from NetApp, the disk storage company, and it talks about the body as a source of big data. And there are a few statistics in here I really like to pull out. One is the estimate that this year, the average hospital will generate 665 terabytes of data. I work at one of the Harvard hospitals. I can tell you that's not an average hospital. The hospital across the street is probably not an average hospital. This may be some community hospital. Our hospitals generate petabytes of data every year. But even small hospitals are generating hundreds of terabytes of data. It's a huge untapped source of information that we can use to advance health and biomedical research. But they're challenges. They're things like medical imaging archives, which are growing rapidly. And these are really um, just an example of the biggest challenge 
in electronic medical records, which is much of the data is unstructured. Even in looking at disease phenotypes, much of the data is in notes that health records, electronic medical records, were not designed as research tools. They were designed for managing the operations of the hospital, which in the case of hospitals in the US at least, means <coughs> billing and reimbursement, getting paid for procedures. And so that's really how these systems were built, and that the diagnostic information is hidden inside those records. And so what we need are better tools to extract that information in meaningful ways and present it so it's useful and usable to the people who want to use it to make discoveries and drive improvements. So have we really transformed medicine? Well, I would argue that new technologies are transforming medicine and biomedical research, just not in the ways we expected, that what they're really doing is turning these endeavors into what increasingly are information sciences. The challenges we face are to bring all of this information together in ways that are useful so that we can address fundamental problems. And that it's not a big data problem necessarily, but a messy data problem. That the biggest challenge we have in health and biomedical research is this data is very complex, often not clean, often it, it's presented in ways that make extraction of useful information a challenge. But if we can overcome those, we have real opportunities to drive discovery. And one of the things that's given us opportunities to do that is to make the argument, which I think we can make very effectively, that if we're able to do this, we can increase efficiency, improve outcomes, and decrease cost for the healthcare system. So we're motivated to do this because we can improve the operation of the system. But to do that, we have to make an investment in research and the infrastructure we need to make the data accessible. Do we need to do this? The answer is absolutely. One of the things that we've seen time and again is the need for data-driven precision medicine. And these are statistics from the US, but I think they probably reflect what's happening here and around the world. The estimate is that in this decade, the incidence in cancer in the US is going to decrease by about 33%. But if you look at the cost, the cost is estimated to increase by 66%. The rate of increase in cost is twice the rate of increase in incidence. What we need to do is to manage those costs by better treating patients. One of the ways that people have argued we're going to do that is by using targeted therapies, that we can identify specific genetic variants in diseases like cancer or in other diseases like cystic fibrosis in which particular genetic variants can be targeted by specific therapeutic agents. And the argument has been that if we identify those patients and give them therapies, we improve outcomes, we reduce costs by not treating them unnecessarily, by not giving the therapies to patients who shouldn't benefit from them, and we can really make strategic decisions about how to best treat our patients and at the same time manage cost. The challenge, though, is that even if we select patients, our biomarkers are imprecise. So this actually reflects responders in black and non-responders in red to targeted therapies in cancer. And what you can see is that there's some drugs like Gleevec for which we can do a very good job of predicting who's going to respond. But other drugs like Tarceva for which we can't. And in fact, if you look at these, what you realize is that even with targeted therapies, we're treating patients who are not going to respond, and a big part of the reason is our data on who the responders are are incomplete. We don't have the best biomarkers yet to make decisions. And this is really symptomatic of a broader problem in medicine. We talk about evidence-based medicine, but in fact, if we look at how we're treating patients, even Cliff Hudis, the president of the American Society for Clinical Oncology, admits that the guidelines we use are largely anecdotal. Even within the NCCN, the National Cooperative Cancer Center Network in the US, which is what sets the standard for standard of care in treating patients, the majority of decision nodes are not supported by high levels of evidence. Medicine is still largely anecdotal. And we have an opportunity now to use data to change that, to really make evidence-based medicine based on evidence where the evidence is encoded in the data that we can collect. So this is the opportunity for the future. This is why this center 
is so important because what it's going to do here in Australia is create the opportunity to collect that data in a useful form and to enable research. So the answers to this have to be driven by data. This is what we need to do. But for that to be successful, we also have to make an investment not only in collecting the data and making it accessible, we also have to make an investment in big data research. So in 2013, the National Research Council, which is part of the US National Academy of Sciences, published a report called Frontiers of Massive Data Analysis. And I've read this report. It's absolutely brilliant in the way it looks at this problem of, of big data and health and biomedical research. They underscore the fact that the challenges in big data go far beyond the technical aspects of managing the data. And they don't belittle those. They recognize that storing, managing, analyzing, doing quality control on data are still essential elements of dealing with big data in health and biomedical research. But there are other challenges. And the key challenge is really the development of rigorous quantitative and statistical methods that are going to allow us to take those data and draw firm conclusions. And they point out that without that, we really face the possibility of turning data into something resembling knowledge when it actually is not. And that overlooking the foundation of rigorous quantitative methods for accessing, analyzing, and interpreting the data may yield results that uh, at best are not useful and at worst are harmful. We are guardians and stewards of the underlying data, and we have to be responsible not only in how we manage it, but also in how we analyze it. So what are the key challenges? Well, a group of colleagues and I got together after this report came out, and we sat in the room and we looked at the problems of big data from a variety of different points of view. Some of us working with imaging data, some with genomic data, some with environmental health data, all of us looking at different diseases and public health uh, problems. And as we looked at this data together, we realized that there were a core set of challenges that we have to address in the research domain. One is simple pre-processing and normalization of data and the identification of what we call hot spots. In genomic data analysis, we've realized this for a long time, that if we want to analyze data uh, like gene expression data, we have to compare measurements made on the same samples by two different individuals or two different laboratories. But my friends who do imaging will tell me that if I put you in an MRI machine and take you across the hall and put you in a different MRI machine, well, I could look at those images and say they're from the same person. Quantitatively, the readings we get are not exactly the same, and so we need techniques to standardize those to know exactly what we're measuring to compare them in a meaningful way. We need tools and better tools for data integration. That We have to understand how to bring data together, how to weight the data appropriately in predictive models, but how also to, uh, to deal with the fact that our data often has hidden correlations that we want to try to use and use effectively without overfitting our models. We have problems with reproducible research. There have been thousands of papers published on predictive biomarkers in cancer. The number of biomarkers that have actually made it into clinical practice I can count on one hand, multi-analyte genomic biomarkers. And a big part of the reason is many of those biomarkers do not survive beyond the initial publication. That we need to validate and replicate and reproduce the findings. And that with big data, we really have the opportunity to do that almost in a holistic fashion. That new data can inform and validate the biomarkers and the conclusions and the models that we build. We need network-based methods, new ways of looking at complex data and the complex interactions that are stored in them. And we also really need to think about things like providing meaningful access to the data and recognizing we need to create portals for the data that different users can use in different ways, often different portals, serving the same underlying data to different communities who have different needs. A biostatistician is going to want access to the data unfettered. A clinician is not going to want a big dump of tables of data. They're going to want meaningful data for an individual patient. A laboratory scientist is going to want to look at populations and compare them to extract meaningful information from those populations. And so everybody wants the same data, but we need to present the data in ways that give you a visceral, intuitive understanding of what's there and give you uh, intuitive ways of pulling out your data 
to meet your own research or clinical needs. And all of these are challenges can be met with appropriate research. So we have an explosion of data. We have data that exists in a lot of different silos. We have cloud computing resources. And we have lots of stakeholders who want access to data. And organizations like the center are really designed to try to look at this universe and bring data to the center in a way that makes it useful, that makes it some, more than the sum of its parts, that really takes it from being a bowl of fruit without the bowl and put the bowl around it so we can actually serve it to the communities that want to take advantage of it in ways that allow us to really extract meaningful insight. One of the th things that it really requires is that we think about how we deliver that data back. And so this is just one of my favorite examples. This is an example that really points to the, the opportunities and the limitations of how we serve data. I've been working on a problem to try to deliver meaningful use, uh, useful information back to clinicians at the point of care. And this is an example in oncology where you can think about looking, say, at colon cancer, and looking, in this case, at KRAS mutations, and look at what those mutations tell you about how you deliver information or how you deliver drugs to patients. And in looking at this problem, we thought that what our physicians would want are nice web-enabled, tablet-enabled results that they could look at and drill into the underlying data and information. And when we talked to them, what we discovered they wanted were PDFs that they could print out. And the sad thing is the reason they wanted PDFs that they could print out was so they could take those printouts and manually scan them into their electronic medical records. Okay? This is 2015. And the vast majority of physicians in the U.S. in clinical practice outside of the major academic medical centers, and I won't talk about what happens there, but the physicians treating 85% of the patients in the U.S. have electronic medical records that can't read in a PDF. They have to print it out and manually scan it because their electronic medical records were designed to turn a room full of files into a disk full of JPEGs. Okay? So that's the state of the art today. And so what we have to think about is delivering meaningful 21st century information into prehistoric information management systems that eventually want to extract information out. We'd love to get to the point where we do have these really modern web-enabled resources that allow individuals to drill into data. And what we've discovered is once they master the PDFs, they really want to have access to the modern tools to look particularly at refractory cases. But that meeting these challenges really require that we, flex that we be flexible and adaptable and listen to our users to understand how they want to use data. And that's an important part of the puzzle. So my nearly closing thoughts, data is really driving the rise of precision medicine. But genomic data without context has limited value. There are many potential producers and consumers of genomic and precision medicine data. And what we have to do is think carefully about how we bring those individuals together, provide them with a common framework to make use of the data, and ultimately to meet their unique needs or their seemingly unique needs, recognizing that each one of them is really only asking for information about one thing, patients, their genomic, clinical, and other data in context. And whether we look at a population or a single patient, that information is the same underlying data that we want to collect. We have to think about data security. We have to think about data integrity. We have to think about data access. But fundamentally, the atom in our system is patients and their data. And we have to think about how we store and manage that data effectively to serve it to these different communities. So information management is the key to the future, provided we keep patients at the center. So just as a closing thought, I like to use this example that big data alone is not a panacea, that we have to think carefully about the analytics and the information we wrap around it. Uh, if you do a web search for spurious correlations, you'll find this site. Uh, it's tylervegan.com. So what he's done is he's collected large sources of public data in the US and provided uh, statistical tools that look for correlations. So this is the correlation between US spending on space science and technology with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. 
And I always point out I know this is wrong because when funding goes up, I'm happy. When funding goes down, I'm sad. Um, so this is obviously wrong. The second example I pull from this website is the correlation between honeybee producing colonies and the anti-correlation, I should say, with juvenile arrest for marijuana possession in the U.S. So if you look at this, apparently, uh, our uh, young people smoking marijuana is actually killing honeybees. So maybe if we legalized marijuana, honeybee populations would recover. Uh, and then finally, um, the number of people who died by becoming tangled with their, in their bed sheets is uh, highly correlated with revenue generated by skiing facilities in the U.S. So if you come to ski in the U.S. next winter, um, just sleep on top of your bed sheets and you should be fine. <laughs> All right? Data is not a panacea. We really need to invest and think carefully about how we analyze it, which is why uh, organizations like these centers are so important. So congratulations, Louise, on uh, obtaining funding. And really, congratulations to everyone who invested in this. Um, I called it an institute. I know I should call it a center. But the center really represents the, precisely the type of investment that's needed to drive both research and practical application in today's data-rich world. Uh, the work to be done here should have broad uh, implications and applications across, he across health and biomedical research. And the research that's being done in big data uh, really should lead to better, more cost-effective outcomes for patients in the healthcare system, which is a big part of the motivation behind creating such a center. This is really the type of center that's needed, and I applaud you for making the investment, for making the commitment to do this, to do a lot of the journeyman's work in making the data accessible. I can tell you it's something, people come to me all the time and say, oh, you like to build databases, don't you? And my answer is, oh, yes, I like to have root canals, too. <laughs> that it's painful, but at the end, you get something that's valuable. And so Louisa should really be applauded for her commitment to making this a reality. So congratulations. Um, I applaud you and what you've been able to achieve so far, and I wish you great success in the future.